Okay, so this morning I'm going to talk how you can uh, combine big data processing in things like Hadoop and Cassandra uh, with working with the graph database and, and kind of make it and, and work with geospatial temporal social network analytics. It's a talk that I gave uh, a month ago, maybe two months ago in New York at the NoSQL conference. Um, and we're recording it today for uh, anyone else to see. Let's see, click here. So what I'm going to talk about first is, of course, the question, why add the graph database to Hadoop and friends? Um, I'll give some reasons. Uh, then I'll talk about some use cases. Some use cases were done by our customers, like Apollo and Los Alamos National Labs. And I'll talk about two use cases where we actually are um, helping uh, our partners and customers um, with this integration. And then I'll give you a demo um, of the last use case, where we look at uh, fraud detection in huge, huge graphs in an online bank. And we'll show you how we can uh, use social network analytics, geospatial and temporal reasoning, embed it in uh, Sparkle 1.1. Um, and then in the end, we talk about how you actually get a graph or uh, a triple representation out of a big data solution. And so we'll t talk also a little bit about our new collaboration with Intel. So that's the contents. So now, why do we want to add graph analytics to Hadoop and friends? Well, the answer is pretty simple. Uh, it's because our customers were doing it, and our customers want us to help with that. And so we already integrated MongoDB and Solar uh, for the last two years. Yeah, so you can store some of your data in Allegro Graph, and then if you want to do more on the text processing side, you can store stuff in, in Solar, and we actually integrated Solar in Allegro Graph through Sparkle. So in one Sparkle query, you can both ask Solar, whatever you want to ask it, and configure your query in Allegro Graph. And the same thing applies to MongoDB. Um, now, Big data is good at many different things. I mean, if you have lots and lots of data um, and you want to do relatively simple analytics or machine learning, then big data, the new big data solutions are fantastic. But if you want to do a real-time graph analytics where you want to get answers within milliseconds, then big data is still not good enough. Yeah? I mean, you can do graph analytics now on Hadoop, but you will get answers back in, in, in seconds and minutes and not in, in milliseconds. Um, if you want to work with semantics, so the meaning of data, or if you want to have a rule base that can be applied to big data sets, then I can tell you that it's extremely hard to translate rules into MapReduce expressions. So, so far, um, triple stores are much better when you deal with semantics and rules, obviously. And then, if you want to do Geospatial and temporal reasoning, then again, uh, big data solutions don't work really well. Just just take think of this example. Say you're having um, electronic healthcare records in your big data solution, and it's for a patient that uh, has been treated for five different diseases. Then if you look at the typical electronic healthcare records, then what you see is a long list of encounters with doctors, test results, but it's about a whole sequences of events and where you actually have multiple stories in the same sequence. Now, there's no way you will write a map reduce query that talks about these sequences of events. That would mean that you would have to write a complete ad hoc big Java program or another language to unbuffle that, and you would lose all the advantages of big data. So again, so if you want to talk about sequences of events, then again, you might want something that is more amenable to uh, structured data uh, analytics. But I'm going to talk about these issues. So let me first talk about a use case that was done by a customer of ours called Apollo. Apollo is the uh, financing, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a holding company that owns the University of Phoenix. And the University of Phoenix wanted to be much, much better in tracking their um, student behavior um, because, right, with the current systems, um, they got all the data they wanted, but it was really hard to see what the current state of the knowledge was of students, where their knowledge gaps were, 
they could look at the material and kind of figure out where usually students stumble or what kind of students stumble. So they did something where they created um, a huge model of all the courses and the syllabi and the books, the tests and the quizzes and the exercises as, uh, as RDF. Yeah, so they stored it in, as a graph in a graph database. But then the models for courses um, uh, were used to generate websites where students can do the exercises and, and read stuff and uh, take quizzes. Um, and that generates an enormous amount of data yeah, that is stored in the Hadoop file system, in a, a Hadoop-like structure. And basically what they wanted to do is they wanted to learn, for example, about the, the, the performance of an individual student compared, say, to the rest of the students. Or they wanted to look at, in a particular course, which part always gives difficulties. And so they learn about it in the big data system through uh, MapReduce and Mahout. And then the results of those queries go actually back into a Lego graph. And so here you have all the real-time knowledge about any student, about courses, etc. Uh, but here's all your big data. So I hope that makes sense. And so this was one first use case uh, that we didn't even help with. It was just, uh, but it was a great example of what, how these two go together. The second example that we uh, came across was done by a customer in Los Alamos National Labs. So they have a huge library of publications, both uh, classified and unclassified. And they were faced with the problem is, you look at an author name on this article and on the other article, and, then, and now you want to know, are these authors the same persons? Well, the typical solution to that is that you, you look at the author and you look at whether this author published with other authors. Um, and of course, this is a recursive problem, because how do you know that the other author is the same author? Uh, that you actually looked at. So it's kind of a recursive problem. And then you can look at an author or a cluster of authors and you look to see whether they're published in the same journals or in the same class of journals or did they actually work for the same affiliation. Um, or you could go even down into the publications and look at the, at the word clouds around an author. Do they use the same words, the same concepts? And they had many, many more ways to do this. And so initially, they did this kind of ana uh, analytics using plainly uh, a plain Hadoop map reduced. And so this is a paper that you can find in our website, um, a white paper from Los Alamos National Labs, that you can read what they actually did. It's a wonderful, well-written paper. Um, but they got on it to some point, and then they decided that to go a little bit further with this and to make it easier to compare authors, they uh, did a new experiment where they used a Lego graph. So still a lot of the processing is in uh, Hadoop, but then for the final comparison and analytics, um, they use uh, a triple store. Yeah. So this, and again, this white paper, or this publication is also on a web site if you want to know about the details. Then a third use case is, and this is actually something we're working on with a partner, is in healthcare. So there's a great report by McKinsey that looks at the value of big data um, for different branches uh, or different domains in our life. Um, and one area that they look at is in healthcare, and they say, that there's huge opportunities if you were able to combine pharmaceutical R&D data that's usually owned by the pharmaceutical companies and by uh, medical colleges. And an example data set would be clinical trials. Then there's the clinical data, and the owners are the hospital and the providers, and the typical data sets would be electronic medical records and medical images. Then you have the, the activity claims, also owned by both hospitals and insurance companies. And then what's really new is um, patient behavior and sentiment data after a patient leaves the hospital. So you see more and more mobile applications for people during the day are asked by an app how they feel, uh, what their blood pressure is, what the sugar level is, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? So, or, or even helps them take pills. So if you can combine this, this, all this data, you can do new kinds of analytics. And so my partner has always this great picture 
And again, by the way, this is a little teaser uh, presentation because I'm going to talk more about it in probably March next year, um, where you can see the different kinds of data sets that people are interested in healthcare, yeah, that have both, both the, the low-level genomic data, but also disease processes and the outcomes of disease processes, and then behavioral data and social data. Yeah? And it all comes together then. Um, and, and so what you can do with this is you can do, what you would like to do is combine the data from in these various areas. Um, and let me, well, let me, let me not go too deep in there here. So here's the meat of what we're actually doing right now, which is, um, so we take these databases, which are all relational databases, all the typical legacy databases that you might even have in a big hospital or in a medical college, yeah? And because most of the time, uh, uh, the owners of these databases won't give you access all the time, we come up with one simple, very simple ETL process where we take every record about a particular patient and doctor and department and store that in Cassandra, yeah? So now we have a unified data storage for all records, including instruction data, and you basically just key it on the patient, the doctor, the department, the files, and the value is literally all the rec records are JSON or, or, or entropies. Actually, we're now leaning to uh, using entropies here. So this is just a big bag of done data. And yes, you can do map reduce queries against this, but there are very, very complex uh, map reduce queries. So, so here's but the, the big advantage is you don't have to bother these people all the time because now you have your own big storage. And then the next layer is a clustering of allegrographs. Um, but now we have structured data. So we have um, our models of patients, of what a doctor is, of what a department is, of a patient history, of how you represent a particular treatment, uh, how you represent a particular diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera, using SNOMED, MESH, and all the other vocabularies, but now you have like a structured representation that combines all the data sets that you have here in a very useful way. And now you can do, for example, cohort analysis. Yeah? You can say you find all the people that have diabetes and uh, low blood pressure and problems with their extremities um, that live in this particular area and that have a particular, this particular gene that is active. Yeah? And maybe then compare this cohort to a completely different cohort. Or you can use this to, say, compare the uh, effectiveness of certain doctors. Yeah? You could look at all the doctors that treat diabetes, and you can just look at all the data, and you can both see w which doctors have more patients that get better, but also the total cost that each patient uh, has. And as everyone on the, on the phone probably knows, we're changing in the U.S. from uh, a philosophy where doctors get and hospitals get paid by the treatment to a system where, pay, where the, uh, hospitals actually get paid for making patients better. Yeah? So you get a budget for a particular disease and if you can manage to make your patient better within the budget then the profit is yours. If you take more treatment or if you uh, like to make uh, 15 MRIs of the same thing then it's, you're completely free to do so if it goes off from your budget. Anyway, this system will also make it easier to then test whether or not we're taking care of the patient in the best possible way. And, um, and again, I'm going to talk about it later, so I'm not going to do it now, but there's many kinds of new analytics that you can do based on this. Um, and I think I'll switch to the next uh, step, given the time that we have. So in the fourth use case is something we did for a huge uh, Asian bank, where we tried uh, an online bank you know, where we asked to look at fraud patterns. Now, just to explain this, so just think of a very simple application where you have accounts, where people open an account at a particular time with a particular email address and a particular IP address in a particular place. Yeah, and think of payments between accounts you know, where you have a sender and a receiver, an amount and an IP address where the payment was made. Very simple. But all in all, that creates a huge gap. And the particular pattern that this bank was interested in was collusion. Yeah? Can I find a pattern where, say, well, the pattern they wanted to call is collusion, 
where one person or a group of person work together to um, get money out of the system. Yeah? So somehow they generated a bunch of money by stealing accounts or by doing a fraudulent transaction. And now you need to get the money as soon as fast as you get out of the system. So what they, what a particular pattern they were looking for is that they find a number of accounts that are opened in a very short amount of time. Okay, so here, this is this is not a very good picture. It's a number of accounts that were opened in a very short time, and then within 30 minutes, other accounts pay large money into these new accounts. Yeah, so account A puts some money in here and here and here. And so all the money is spread out over these new devices within 30 minutes of them opening these new accounts. And then in the next hour, all the money is, is, is kind of pushed out of the system through foreign credit cards, foreign bank accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that still might be all OK. Yeah? But if you also then can find that the accounts that were just opened had interesting relationships based on maybe the fact that they these people appear together on certain websites, uh, whether the accounts are open from the same IP address or at least in the same city, um, or these people have a relationship with other known fraudulent accounts. <laughs> and if you can do the same thing here, then this becomes kind of a signal that there might be some collusion going on. And this is, of course, and you can imagine that this is very hard to do if you just had this data in sitting in a plain Hadoop, uh, which this bank actually had. They had the data sitting in a Hadoop-like structure. Because if you look at this analysis, it's looking at temporal aspects. Yeah, a bunch of accounts opened. Then other accounts paid money into this. Uh, then the money flowed out of these accounts. And we could establish relationships between these. It's all graph search, graph search, graph search, temporal and geospatial. And so what we did is we took the data out of Hadoop and turned it into a Lego graph representation. Still billions and billions of triples. Yeah. Um, and then we represented the data in a very simple event ontology. Yeah. So um, events, so transactions have a certain type. Each transaction uh, has a list of actors. Uh, an event always happens somewhere. And there's always a start time and sometimes an end time for these things. So this is a typical event ontology that we've used and talked about in other webcasts. Yeah. Um, and then these events are obviously everywhere. I mean, telephone calls, SMSs, emails, social media payments, insurance claims, e-commerce. Almost everything can be, can be described as events. And we actually try to do that all the time. And then what we do is we can analyze these events using uh, social network analytics and graph analytics or using our temporal libraries or geospatial reasoning. Then what we now can do is we can do all these things, and we actually have embedded that in Prolog and in Sparkle. So just talking about these libraries for social network analytics, um, we have, I would say, about 20 to 30 functions that you can, that you can use to answer the four most important questions in social network analytics, like, how far is account one from account B, and how strong is the relationship? Um, looking at a particular uh, person or account, what are the groups that this person belongs in? And it can be very simple, like an ego group, like the, the friends or the friends of friends, or fully connected groups, like a click. Or you can look at a group, and you want to compute how important a particular person is in a group. And we have about four measures in the Lego graph to compute the importance of a person in the group. And then finally, you can look at a group, and you can try to figure out if this group has a leader or not. Yeah. And again, we have a number of measures for that. Then we employ, uh, we um, implement geospatial reasoning. Uh, so we have special geospatial indices. And what we're really good at is finding all the events that happen within a certain number of miles from another event. Uh, but in addition to that, we also do uh, many polygon calculations. Um, all of that is described in our documentation. And finally, we make it very easy to reason about time. We uh, have implemented uh, Allen's uh, uh, time logic. And basically, we, gen we generated simple predicates for every possible way that two durations can be related. 
And in addition to that, we also look at how points can relate to each other or to other durations. And then that all uh, accumulates into what we call um, uh, our golden query, yeah, where we actually can do queries where we mix social network analytics, database lookup, reasoning, temporal, and spatial. Yeah? So a query like find all the meetings that happened in November within five miles of Berkeley that was attended by the most important person, the Jans' friends, and friends of friends. Yeah? Um, yeah, so look at this query, which is a prologue. And in a few minutes, I'm going to show you a Sparkle equivalent of this one. Yeah, so you say, well, find all the people around Jans two levels deep, then compute the importance uh, of every person in the group, and start with the most important x first. And for this x, find all the events where x was an actor, where x, where the event was a meeting, and the event happened in this time interval within five miles of Berkeley. Yeah. So I'm going to show you that live in a few seconds. And so here's the demo. So again, reiterating, we had a bunch of accounts opened at some time at an IP address with an email in a particular location. And we have events, which are the payments between accounts from some IP address at some location at some time. And then we have locations related to the longitudes. So let me give a quick demo. Some people might have seen this demo before. Uh, let's see. Um, let me go here. Yeah. So let me look at for a particular account. You can find Bruce, Bruce Rossi at Hitachi.com. So it's, this is a um, an account. I can double click it and I can look at it. So I can see that this account started at this particular time, expressed as general time, uh, with a particular IP address and an account number and an account place. Now I can click on this one, and now we are the Geo Names database. Which that most people might be familiar with the database of seven million places on Earth. Where each place is a latitude longitude. If it's a populated area, also how many people live there, etc. So let me go back. Um, and then this person paid other person and was paid by other person. And so um, let me look at a particular payment. So Bruce Rossi is the receiver of this particular um, uh, a transaction. So here's a transaction that take, take time and an IP address in a completely different place, Miami Lakes, and here's the sender and the receiver. Yeah. So I can actually explore this graph on the screen. I can say see I can select sender and receiver. And I can say, well, here is some e events where Bruce Rossi is or the sender and the receiver. And I click on this again, and let me just take a few of those. And this and kind of keep exploring the uh, the graph on the screen. I can reformat it, and so you can see how I can play with the graph and find relationships between certain people and relationships between people. Anyway, you get the point. Yeah, it's a big graph with accounts and, send and, and and transactions between accounts. So now let me show you this one query that I wanted to show you. So I can set up, go to the web interface to the product. And let me look at a query. So you might remember that a, few, a minute ago, I gave you what I call the golden query, where we mix social network analytics with uh, geospatial and temporal. Well, here we do now the same thing in Sparkle. Yeah, so here's the English translation of the query. Did the most important friend of Sonia make a payment within 100 miles of Rotterdam in the last 10 years? Yeah. So what we do is we look at, uh, for the first people in the audience that know Sparkle, and I guess everyone does by now, and so we say, find the place Rotterdam, yeah, and give me the location. Then find for the person Sonia Madrid uh, I mean, find the subject, find the person with the email Sonia Madrid. Then, and here we have what we call a magic predicate that computes the group around Sonia two levels deep using the paper relationship. And then 
what we do is using the trade relationship in this group, we compute the importance of every person in the group using this magic predicate called active degree centrality. So now we know for every person, for every member in the group, how important the person in the group is around Sonia. And then we find all the events uh, for a, a particular member. Uh, and we looked at whether this member lived in another place. And this, again, is, is a magic function where we look whether but this other place is within five miles of the location that we found here, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is a little bit nerdy, but I guess that uh, most of the people are uh, more technical. But I hope you see the relevance of this. And can you just imagine that you would do this in a Hadoop-based solution, where you both have to do social network analytics and look at the geospatial part and look at the temporal parts? Um, now, all these magic predicates, by the way, uh, Greg is just pointing at me that I just jumped to the topic of magic predicate. But if you go to our website, documentation, grounds, magic, predicates, <coughs> and here you see the sparkle magic pre predicates, properties, sorry, properties, um, that are the geospatial ones, the social network ones, the temporal ones. Yeah, so you can study that more in this on this particular site. Okay, going back in the chat window. Oh, and the link is in the in the correct. Just type the link for the page in the chat window, because there were several people asking about it. All right. Okay, so that was a demo, and again, I challenge you to do the same query in any other big data solution. It's just going to well, there's undoubtedly very smart people that can do it. It's going to be really hard, and it's going to be a really long MapReduce query. All right, so now the question is, how do you get the triples out of Hadoop? Well, we at France started working on what we call an allegograph Hadoop connector. Yeah. So where you have your typical big data that flows into um, some form of, of, of Hadoop or Cassandra or whatever you want to use. And then you get data out using MapReduce, which can be in any kind of form. And we take all these forms, by the way, we take JSON, XML, flat files, common separate files, and turn it into triples. So now you can do your advanced analytics. Um, and we are working on this um, on this Hadoop connector. But then we started collaborating with Intel. Well, let me first talk about um, how this usually works. So the example that I always give is um, from the Enron database. Um, you know all the emails of uh, the company Enron that was cheating on us here in California. Um, and in the lawsuit that that we saw as, as a result of all the corruption, um, we got a database, well, the public got a database with about half a million emails uh, from the top 150 people in the company. And so this is a fun, actually a tiny example, but we wanted to use it as an example of how to get triples out of Hadoop. Yeah, so we this code is available if people want it. Um, but the chance was get the wicket from to graph out of into a graph. Yeah. So you want to find every time Jans sent an email to Bruce, and I want to find that I did it 233 times. Yeah. So using traditional MapReduce, um, it took about 432 lines of Java code from scratch. Yeah, that generated about 400 million relationships. And it's pretty fast for four machines with eight mappers and four reducers. We can do this health that we can create the weighted graph in Java in 33 seconds. And then in 12 more seconds load in the Lego graph. So you can get the whole graph in 35 seconds um, in a Lego graph. But the problem is that's far too many lengths of Java and too much expertise required. So Intel is working on a new product called the Graph Builder to make it a lot easier to get graphs out of Hadoop and other big data databases. Um, and so we started an official collaboration with them. And they created a product uh, called Graph Builder, open source. Uh, version 1 is out, and they real soon have to hope to have uh, a version out called uh, the version 2, which then will do a full support of RDF. And with this system, it is far, far easier um, to 
uh, extract triples. Now, the reason they also want to work with triple stores is, of course, part of it is just doing graph search. Yeah, and yes, they are interested to make it easier for graph databases in general to get graphs out of triples. But they also re realize that it's far more important also to look at the semantic relationships between nodes that you find, and ultimately even go to the level of machine learning. Uh, and that is why they also um, are in this uh, getting into this IDF business. Yeah? And so uh, Intel did an experiment where they could do the same thing in uh, 100 lines of Java code. Oh, sorry. This is actually another data set. It's the wiki data, the underlying data for the Wikipedia. And they wanted to extract all the people and the categories that are related. And they can do that. Uh, and this is actually far more complicated than getting the data out of the Enron database. They can do it now in about 100 lines of Java code. And they're working to make that even less uh, less hard. So ultimately, I hope they can do it in 30, 40 lines of Java code. OK, and expect this to be available in, like, I don't want to talk for Intel, but it might be in the early next year. Um, and that actually concludes my presentation, because it is uh, 30 minutes now. Let's see if there's any questions. Um, where can I find the Los Alamos papers? Well, you can go to the, uh, the link in the chat window. Oh, we, we, we posted that link in the, in the chat window. There's some people asking about it. Yes, yeah, so we have a white paper section on the website. Um, oh, so someone was looking, probably saw a graph for the first time. He asked, will graph also work with Sparkle endpoints? Well, actually, probably, well, what can I say, end of the year, early next year, we can have uh, graph work with uh, external um, uh, Sparkle endpoints like DBpedia or what what do you have? I actually can even demo it if you're interested, but I'll probably demo that next month. Where can I get the a graph Hadoop connector? Um, well, as I said, we have collaborating with Intel. And actually, if you have an interesting problem, just contact me or contact Craig. Um, because we, there's still an opportunity for people to join in this collaboration. So if you have very interesting data sets, and I know everyone here in the audience will have interesting data sets, but we have only uh, a limited amount of bandwidth. Uh, but if you want to, you uh, please talk to us about it, and you might be able to get into this collaboration and do some fun stuff with the Lego Graph and Intel. Um, OK. If I understand well, a Lego graph automatically converts key value pairs into RDF graphs? No. No, no. Because in Cassandra, key value pairs can be anything. So in our case, key, uh, now you have to do a lot of processing. The, the solution that I showed you with Cassandra, you basically can say, give me all the objects for a particular patient. And then in your Java program or whatever you have, you can turn that into triple. So you have to do that work yourself. But um, we make it easy to link up to this uh, to Cassandra. Is it necessary to use Sparkle to make queries? I don't know what that query actually means. I mean, we can use Prolog to do queries or uh, Sparkle. Or you can write direct JavaScript code, or you can write Lisp code, whatever you want. Let's see if there's another. Why providers or clients of software against fraud never mention graph databases? Um, uh, that's a good question. I mean, fraud detection in many cases is actually about relationships between companies and or relationship between people and companies. And so I know that the people in the financial world, world that look at money laundering and corruption are considering graph databases to look at those relationships. 
Um, how does your healthcare solution compete with others? Watson. Um, wow, that's a huge question. Well, I think um, the solution that we talked about is far more practical. It's about integrating all these different data sets. And for example, compare a cohort of diabetes users of this particular type against a group of diabetes users of this other kind and look at all the differences uh, in the treatments that they had and the diagnosis and the whatever you can, in the genes that might be a precondition. Um, I don't think, Watson is currently more focused on, for example, um, whether it can predict whether given certain symptoms you have a particular disease. And I think there's a great article out there that shows that Watson is probably already better at predicting certain uh, diseases than, than doctors are. But the stuff that we're doing is much more um, practical um, aimed at both life science research and quality assessment by the business people in hospitals. Okay, I think we should leave it at this.